Hello, everyone. This is the lovely Vice President of Internet Infidels, Edward Tamesian. You all know me for my scholarly paper that was accepted for publication on the origin of evil and theistic art determinism that's still available online. And today, for the seventh time, I'm going to be interviewing the one and only Prince of the Christ myth theorist, Dr. Robert M. Price. Before we begin the questions, I'll have him say anything he would want to say, and so far as uh, wanting to solicit any new publications or talk about that and any upcoming lectures he has or people ways people can reach him, he can talk about that, and we'll go into the questions. Take it away, Dr. Robert M. Price. Okay, uh, I guess I should point out that uh, I'm uh, working with uh, Bishop Ray Taylor on uh, his show, uh, Wise as Serpents, or Wise as a Serpent. Uh, we've had a couple of these shows uh, and uh, up to now, and they're going to be broadcast, um, or whatever you call it, uh, on uh, YouTube, Facebook, uh, and a couple of other ones. And uh, uh, sometimes I'll be on with somebody, like tomorrow I'll be on with uh, Ralph Ellis. And uh, uh, interesting things are planned. I, I think he said that Bart Ehrman wants to uh, talk to me about the, or no doubt refute me, uh, on my uh theory, not that I came up with it originally, uh, that uh, Paul and Simon Magus were the same person. And uh, so all sorts of interesting things uh, are in the works. Uh, Book-wise, uh, I have two that are just uh, uh, chafing, at, is it ch chomping at the bit? I forget uh, what, what you call it, uh, to, to come out. One is called The Heresy of Paraphrase, uh, where I um, present a kind of targum approach to the four gospels uh these these ancient targums were uh paraphrases of uh, old testament books uh, that built in the commentary it was like kind of like the living bible they were trying to give the gist to those who fellow jews who couldn't read the scripture in hebrew anymore and so they were putting in aramaic and uh, kind of loosely so, and it's very valuable to show us how people were reading these things uh, in New Testament times. And so I decided, uh, you know, I, I would kind of like to do that because when I summarize uh, Bible stories, I tend to put my own spin on them. And uh, I thought, let me uh, see if I can do that with the whole text. And wow, was it fun to do. And uh, sometimes I have Jesus saying what I think he should have said rather than what he did. And, and, and so John forth. Dominic Crossland. <laughs> and, and then I got another one, a massive, uh, last last time I did a word count or a page count, uh, it comes out to 666 pages. <laughs> so I guess uh, watch out for that one. But it's called The uh, Houses of the Holy, a higher critical survey of the world religions. And I'm really proud of that. And uh, uh, that one is supposed to come out early in, um, in 2024, though I'm not sure exactly when. Okay. Gotcha. All right, guys, check out Robert's work and make donations on his mind vendor website. He needs the money. Carrier needs the money. We all need the money, especially me. Is that a 501c3 <laughs> nonprofit? It's almost impossible to find a paying job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All righty. So for our first question, I'm sure when you were a fundamentalist Christian, you heard a lot about, uh, you know, going off of the Bible is the sole authority and only going off of the canon of Scripture. But of course, uh, if you didn't know it then, you realized it later that there's a little bit of a problem identifying the canon since we don't even know what it is, even assuming Jesus rose from the dead. This is especially apparent with the Old Testament canon where you have Roman Catholics, Protestants, and even Greek Orthodox debating what belonged in the Old Testament. And uh, so I kind of wanted to talk about that because, you know, it's a real interesting topic because we're still debating this even in 2023. So to give a little bit of a brief rundown for our audience what the issue is. So Roman Catholics have, you know, added seven extra books to the Old Testament. Of course, they'll just say the Protestants are in a state of venial sin for taking them out. They have seven books that they, uh, additional books to the Protestant Old Testament canon, plus additional segments of Daniel and Esther. They're books like Tobit uh Sirach, Baruch, you know, books like that, first and second Maccabees, and the Greek Orthodox has 10 extra ones. And so um 
I won't go into all the details. That'll take like three hours long. You can watch a debate like with Trent Warren versus you know, a Protestant scholar on this issue for more specific details, but to just give the strongest argument for both sides. So the Roman Catholics will say, you know, hey, the Council of Carthage, you know, which came, which had origins going all the way back to the apostles, the Council of Carthage in 397 AD selected, you know, the books, um, you know, like books like Tobit, you know, you know, Sirach and uh, Baruch, and they said uh, they were inspired. And if people believe that God's working with the church, they should accept their Roman Catholic canon. And um, they'll say, like, no immediate council in that time came back and said, hey, these guys have the wrong canon. They're not the true church. Here's the, here's the real, you know, canon, which, you know, allegedly is supposed to be the Protestant canon. But, of course, that came for people to really challenge that canon was Martin Luther later on. And then they'll say that the late Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Masoretic, the late Septuagint after 85 AD had the Roman Catholic canon for the Old Testament, and then the Roman Catholic will surmise and say, well, before 85 AD, the early Septuagint must have had them too. You know, why not? We don't hear anything about rabbis saying the old one had a different list, and then the new one had the additional ones. So that's the strongest arguments from, the, you know, a Mary Hyperdulist. And uh, the Protestants will say their essential argument will be, well, you know, we'll admit that Jesus didn't explicitly reference, you know, the Old Testament canon. Um, they'll say things like, you know, when he talked about the blood of Abel to the blood of Zachariah, who's was indirectly outlining the, the Protestant Old Testament canon. Of course, you know, just like Carrier has a problem with the Steve of David's uh, interpretation, because it's like, even if Carrier's right now, how did the Jewish and Gentile audience know about, like, what, you know, that Jesus was supposed to be a, like a semen taken out of David, but in a cosmic sperm bank? It's like the same thing here, like, how would the Jewish audience have known about, you know, him indirectly outlining a canon, like, so even if Jesus meant it that way, the, the Jewish audience isn't going to understand that. So that's probably not the truth that Jesus went directly outlining the Old Testament canon, which correlated to the Protestant canon. Um, so they'll say, hey, there's no explicit reference for Christ on the Old Testament canon. Or they'll say like, oh, um, he could have been referencing when the Jews reference books. Sometimes they group the books together, but it's like, you know, he could have been referencing individual books when he quoted them. So there's that. So their strongest argument, the Protestant's argument is Josephus against Apion. And this is a letter given um, in 96 AD to Apion. And to quickly summarize, Apion, or, uh, Josephus says to Apion that, you know, the Jews, history is different from the Greeks because though the Greeks have errors and really long time periods in them that aren't historical, the Jews' histories are different because they're uh, infallible, because they're given by the oracles of God. And Josephus gives a timeline of when these written um oracles were given he says from the time of moses to the time of Xerxes, which correlates with the uh Protestant Old testament canon and so uh to ask you dr robert and price uh let's presuppose you know that christianity is true and jesus is gone he rose from the dead what do you think the historic or even i mean even if he didn't i guess it really, really wouldn't matter what do you think the historical jesus independent of whether he was a whether he was god or not what do you think he would have considered as the true legitimate canon the roman catholic old testament canon the protestant old testament canon or the greek orthodox old testament well uh, of course most of the well all of the new testament would be post jesus as you say so the question is uh, uh what about the the what was the extant uh canon in his day well uh in luke 24 the risen jesus says uh well it, luke says that the risen jesus explained all the references to himself for prophetic predictions in the law the prophets and the psalms well, that kind of reminds you of the three traditional uh, Tanakh uh, sections if the Psalms is taken as the collective title of the whole group of the writings, so-called, uh, because it, would, it leads off that group of, of wisdom and uh, poetic works like um, uh, Job and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon. 
But this is a little bit problematical because it, you can't beg the question and assume that he didn't know uh, the book of Sirach or the wisdom of Solomon, which are certainly, I, I always, in my uh, introduction to the Bible, Holy Fable, I guess in volume one, I say that I, I call Sirach a kind of bigger and better book of Proverbs, which is high praise because Proverbs has all kinds of great stuff in it. Very, very wise. Uh, but so does Sirach. It's, and the Wisdom of Solomon, they're all very uh, good books. And then you got the shocking uh, sort of cyn capital C cynicism of uh, and slash Epicureanism of the book of Ecclesiastes or Koheleth the preacher, literally. Uh, and Job, boy, they, that's heretical seeming. Uh, Job has like given up on the tradition of nice guys finish first. Uh, like in the Psalms, uh, this one psalmist says, I've lived a long time and I've never seen the righteous get the short end of the stick. Oh, you haven't? Uh, uh, and uh, Job says, well, that's all I'm getting and I haven't sinned and uh, God knows it. So why is he doing this to me. Uh, so, but nonetheless, I mean, it's wise to have this range of per, uh, perspectives. So was Jesus talking about those two? What would he have said or what would Luke have said, I guess is more to the point. We don't know. He might well have been referring to those books uh, in shorthand form, like uh, what's it, uh, synecdoche apart for the whole. That, that might well be. But then again, he doesn't refer to the Torah as Genesis, the, the first book of that. So who the heck knows? Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, we can, uh, plus um, uh, there's, uh, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is depicted as speaking of scripture as a whole, as, as if it were the Torah. Uh, he says, scripture cannot be broken. Well, what, what does that mean? Uh, well, he's not thinking of Moses smashing the tablets, so that would be literally breaking. But his point seems to be everything in scripture is legally binding. Uh, it's like a law, even if it's a historical narrative or something. If it gives you some sort of principle, hey, you're stuck with it. Uh, don't think you can disregard it. Uh, but uh that doesn't really help here because he's saying the whole extent of scripture, whatever it is, uh, is uh, is like a, a, an ironclad law. Uh, so uh, I think it really, the only way to really argue it is what version of the Bible did the uh, earliest Christians we know of use? And that seems to be, uh, most of them anyway, the, the Greek Septuagint, because both Gentiles and Diaspora Jews, which was most Jews, uh, they couldn't read Hebrew anymore or Aramaic, so they had to have a Greek version. And as far as we know, the Septuagint, the, the translation of the 70, so-called, uh, they which they thought was equally inspired along with the Hebrew, uh, that... Uh, had the the books that the Catholic Church now refers to as deuterocanonical. They kind of they're kind of admitting that it's a kind of an appendix, but no less authoritative or inspired for that reason. And as you point out, there there are parts of books uh, and added sections of uh, of the Book of Daniel. Um, each one has a title, the throng, the uh, song of the three young men or the three holy children, different renderings, uh, Bell and the Dragon, which is really interesting because it's about the uh, cheap stunts the Babylonian priests used to do to make you think they were performing miracles. It's great. Uh, and then Susanna. Uh, and uh, it's it's really fascinating. Then uh, there's additions to Esther because Hebrew Esther never happens to mention God. Uh, and uh, it's it sort of left to your... Uh, you have to read between the lines because it's very obvious that divine providence is what the book is all about. Like, have you come to the throne for such a time as this? Well, that implies, yeah, God put you where you are. But they figured, yeah, it's a little odd. And uh, so they added new passages where God is made explicit. Um, so there are those bits and pieces. But then there's the wisdom of Solomon, the wisdom of uh, 
Jesus ben Sira or Sirach, uh, also called Ecclesiasticus. Uh, there's the book of Baruch, including the epistle of Jeremiah, sometimes considered a separate book, but it's the last chapter of it. Uh, then there is Tobit, uh, which is very interesting in a lot of ways. Uh, then uh, Judith, uh, who was a real uh, heroine of, of Israel, uh, she, this, the, <laughs> this, the, uh, the uh, one, whatever tribe of Israelites she belongs to, uh, defeats a Canaanite oppressor, and he's taken it on the lamb from the, the, battle where they, which he lost and he asks for refuge in the tent of this uh, woman called uh, Judith and she uh, says oh yeah yeah I'll, I'll be happy to uh, give you a place to sleep tonight and she feeds him and then he uh, zonks out and he's snoring and then she brings out the hammer and the the railroad spike wham right in the temple uh and uh fascinating stuff uh and uh there's uh these books all have value and and oddly enough and, and what i'm saying is that greek speaking christians and diaspora jews to to them this was these books were simply part of the bible as they knew it uh where where it starts to divide is that at some point late in the first century of the common era so the rabbis at Yavna, who were like reconsolidating Judaism after the Roman destruction of the temple, they were trying to, to uh, nail down the exact borders of the canon, which implies that it wasn't universally agreed on until then. Uh, okay. And uh, why could Esther even be in it, since it doesn't mention God, at least in Hebrew, and these guys were working with the Hebrew Bible. Or uh, how about the Song of Solomon? Is, is God in this thing, even by implication? It's it's a kind of an erotic love song. What the heck? And uh, they said, no, nah, no. And, and uh, some of the rabbis said, hey, you're taking it too literally. This is about the love of God for Israel. And then later Christians said, well, it's the love of Christ for the church. But uh, there's, you know, that's just desperate. Uh, but they were wondering. And finally they said, yeah, yeah, all right. It goes in. Or Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel has this elaborate blueprint for uh, how to build the new temple, but they didn't wind up using it. And so they said, what is, is this a false prophecy? Uh, and so some thought, no, it's not going in. But others said, no, come on, it's, it's obviously real prophecy. So they had these debates, but they did not include the ones that existed in Greek. Uh, and uh, so the, the the rabbis said, these books and no others, nothing really wrong with the other books. But if, if they're not in Hebrew, you know, I don't think they really count as inspired scripture. Uh, and uh, now this debate went on between Augustine and Jerome, because Augustine said, Oh yeah, sure. They're they're fine. They're they're part of the Bible. And Jerome says, I I wouldn't be too sure about that. And but the church went with Augustine's view until Martin Luther, an Augustinian monk, uh, started the Reformation, and says, you know, I think those rabbis were right. Uh, those really are the only inspired Old Testament, as we would call them, books. Um, and uh, he, our, he even he did not think that the oh uh, first and second Maccabees these history books were in there too. Uh, he said there's a, a couple of them are kind of problematical, but uh, they're on the whole good, edifying books. And in fact, all Protestant Bibles, including the King James, printed the these books and called them the Apocrypha, uh, and. Uh, which only denoted that they weren't to be read publicly in the liturgical cycle. It wasn't a condemnation. Uh, and even the King James until 1823 uh, contained the Apocrypha. So it's not like they were trying to stamp it out. But at some point, they uh, stopped including it. But still, like the Revised Standard Version of Protestant work, even they did the uh, the Apocrypha and so forth. So uh, it's kind of a tempest in a teapot in a way. Where it really gets interesting, though, is 
uh, some of the so-called apostolic Orthodox churches, not Eastern Orthodox, but different because they're Monophysites. Uh, that's another whole ancient Christological debate. Like the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, the Armenian Orthodox Church, they have extra books that nobody else does. Like uh, they, they have the Book of Enoch in the Old Testament. Oh. First uh, Enoch. Tert mm -hmm. Go ahead. First Enoch. Yes, that's right. Uh, right. Which is which survives in Ethiopic. Uh, we have bits of it in Greek and Aramaic. They said, "Hey, Bible," uh, and and it is a very important book uh, for for New Testament background, at least. Uh, in uh, the Armenian Church, they have Third Corinthians, which is, is was circulated uh, and until it it was sort of a. Uh, sewn into the apocryphal acts of Paul. And then there were loads of other books, uh, both Old Testament-ish, the so-called pseudepigrapha, and there are loads of them. Uh, the first and second apocalypses of Baruch, second and first, second and third Enoch, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, and on and on and on. It's amazing. Uh, and uh, and then there were loads of New Testament books, uh, the Epistle of Peter to James, the Epistle of Peter to Philip, uh, the Gospel of Peter, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Revelation of Paul, the Apocalypse of Paul, and on and on is several uh -huh. Acts of the Apostles. Uh, and they didn't make it into the canon, but again, it's kind of a semantic issue because people were reading and copying these things, which is how we have them today. So somebody regarded them as scripture. And, and who, and, and for Protestants to uh, say, you mentioned the idea of sola scriptura, we, we just go with the Bible, period. Eh, no, you don't. Because who defined the Bible? The tradition of the church. And yeah. who tells you how the Bible ought to be read? Whatever, not capital T tradition as in the Catholic Church, but the uh, informal tradition of all the denominations. Like, is yeah. it an accident that everybody in the Presbyterian Church happens to believe in predestination? No, that's the tradition <laughs> of the church that says so, or infant baptism. It, that's not clear in the New Testament, but it is in the uh, uh, dogmatic books of Calvin and so forth. So they're much more Catholic than they realize. And when they say scripture alone, they're sawing off the very branch they're sitting on. They're undermining the authority of what they think is their sole authority. So it's very ironic. Yeah. And like uh, going back to, you know, Josephus against Apion, I guess if I were a Catholic, I would say, I don't buy Trent Horn's argument that he's just making an exaggeration because it all goes back to like the, but it said about the seed of David thing and the blood of Abel, the blood of Zachariah statement. It's like, do you think Apion's going to catch the exaggeration? Because like uh, Trent Horn's like, oh, you know, Josephus, like, you know, says Jews know the real canon from the day they're born. He makes a couple of exaggerations like that. And so uh, Trent Horn surmises that uh josephus is exaggerating the canon which doesn't make like just because he's exaggerating some things doesn't necessarily imply he's going to exaggerate everything and like you know apion want to catch the exaggeration either so it looks like josephus legitimately thought that the Protestant old testament canon was the only legitimate canon but it's like you know like you know how did josephus get his information you know it's just like you know okay it's like going down like through a game of telephone back to you know someone in the past like they could the you know the people in the past could have given them the wrong canon you know, because it's like even Jews um, during the days of Josephus, you know, as you pointed out, you know, there was no standardized canon, uh, you know, like in like 30 AD to like 70 AD for the Jews, you know, I think the Essenes had their own different canon. The Pharisees and mm -hmm. Sadducees, I think, may, might have had a similar canon, but the Essenes well, the didn't. The Sadducees had only the Pentateuch, which oh, really? is same with the Samaritans. They consider that's why. In the gospel, Jesus, uh, he says that they try to, Sadducees come up to Jesus and say, uh, you believe in this resurrection idea? Uh, suppose this happened. He says uh, the leveret marriage thing. This guy gets married. He doesn't manage to, to beget any children. He croaks. Uh, according to leveret marriage, his uh, oldest brother has to uh, beget children to, to the widow. Uh, but uh, so that 
for inheritance reasons, the, the kid born will be considered the legal heir of the, the dead man. Uh, but he dies before he can do anything about it. And so through seven brothers, it could happen. It's a hypothetical. And he said, now, uh, when the resurrection happens, presuming they all make it, who's she going to be married to? She was the wife of all of them. Uh, what are you going to have a collective marriage up there? And uh, Jesus says, you, you don't know what you're talking about. And as for the resurrection, uh, well, yeah, for the resurrection, nobody's going to be married anymore in the resurrection. I mean, why do you have begetting children? Because individuals die, and this is the way to keep the human race going. Yeah. Well, if you're in heaven or you're raised, you're immortal. You don't need a new generation. So there's not going to be any marriage. That's pretty good thinking. But then he says, you don't think that uh, that uh, the Bible mentions resurrection of the dead? And then he gives them this incredibly lame argument uh, where uh, God says to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Jesus says, you see that? He didn't say I was but I am presuming that they're still around worshiping him somehow, somewhere. Uh, whoo, boy, is that, that is just uh, uh, so far-fetched. Why did he have to resort to a stupid argument like that when there are clear references in Daniel and Isaiah and so forth? Well, because the Sadducees wouldn't have listened to that. Th those other books, they're not even scripture to them. It's It's got to be in the big five or forget it. And again, the uh, the Samaritans, same thing. Okay, yeah, you know, I think Trent Horde brought that up too. So it's like Jesus is like acting as if their canon is the only legit canon, though it yeah, isn't. For uh, purposes otherwise, of there's no basis for, okay. for the dialogue. Talking to him. Okay, yeah, I see. Okay, yeah. yeah, so yeah, that illustrates the point that even according to the Bible, Jews back in the days of Christ had different ideas of the canon. Yeah. So there wasn't a solidified canon. So like Josephus against Apion, like, that, that's just, I mean, Josephus was smart and he was a historian and stuff, but, you know, it's historical science. He can't go back in time to see whether, you know, Judith wrote with automatic writing by God or not, you know, or so there, yeah, mm -hmm. there's, there's that. All right. Yeah. So that's interesting. So, you know, well, we'll never know. We'll never know what books, you know, are truly a part mm -hmm. of the Old Testament canon, even if, you know, the Jewish God exists. <laughs> oh, well. Until right. we go to heaven. Hallelujah. And we go to heaven, hallelujah, he determines us, because <laughs> everything's determined, because <laughs> I prove in my paper. Anyway, all righty, so going into our second question, um, this is interesting. Can we, you know how we mentioned Sola Scriptura? There's another uh, hmm. point I'm going to make that kind of debunks the issue of Sola Scriptura. It's the tradition of the exorcist. I came up with, it, with this one myself, because I think it's interesting. So um, after Jesus is accused of doing uh, miracles by the devil... Uh, by the Pharisees, they come up with like the Beazerup theory. They're like, oh, okay, this is a real miracle, they say. It doesn't have any chance of a national explanation, but they say, oh, Jesus' power to cast out demons comes from devils. And so Jesus is like, oh, that doesn't make sense for Satan to be casting out other demons. What motive would he have? It'd be a kingdom divided against itself. And then he brings up the point, he's like, oh, hey, so even if I cast out demons by the power of the devils, uh, your sons, who do they cast out demons by? So he's like, Jesus is like, hey, you know, you're not saying they're doing it by the devil. You're saying they're doing it by God. So how come you're not saying I do it by God? It's like a double standard thing. So here, now there's two options here. Jesus could be, you know, just like with the Sadducees and assuming their canons right, even though it, you know, it isn't, there's more books to be included. He could be assuming exorcists before him had the Holy Ghost and could do exorcisms. He could be assuming that even though it's not the truth, perhaps Christ was the first exorcist by the power of the Holy Spirit who could exorcise demons. Or it could be illustrating that indeed exorcists before him were able to do valid exorcisms by the power of the Holy Spirit. So there's a 50-50 chance here. If we do like a, ba a Bayesian analysis kind of thing, where there's a 50% chance, you know, Jesus is implying that the exorcist before him could do miracles by the power of God. So I'm going to assume that for the sake of argument. So here's the thing. Where did they get the idea of doing exorcisms and how to perform the ritual of exorcisms? Because even Jesus, when talking with uh, the demoniac that had the legion of demons in him, he indirectly asserts that the right way to go about an exorcism is to ask the demon its name. Indeed, he asked the demon its name, and it doesn't matter whether he had suspended attributes, suspended attributes, and forgot what he named the demons <laughs> the, uh, during the pro when the prologue of John happened. 
It does, or, or he's just, you know, uh, doing that just to draw attention on the guy's condition of how many demons he has. But he's, you know, he's following the procedures of the rabbis. It's an oral tradition, and it's not from the older, it's not explicitly mentioned in the, um, implicitly even in the Old Testament. He asked the demon its name. I'm sure he did that on other occasions, unrecorded. So here's the thing. So Jesus is showing that this tradition is valid and uh, therefore infallible to when you do an exorcism to ask the demon its name. And then hope Holy Spirit gives you enough magic to exercise demons, because according to Christ, you know, hey, certain demons don't come out. Some are so powerful, you need prayer and fasting, right? So, you know, there's that too. So here's the thing. So since this is not mentioned, we're, you know, we're assuming Jesus is God and God exists here. Um, where did this idea come from since it's not explicitly mentioned? And uh, or implicitly in the Old Testament. Well, okay, okay. The you know chief priests and scribes and the uh, rabbis got it from like you know going through the game of telephone back to whom, and how did they come up with that idea? So my implication is, if this Christianity stuff is true, it either was God or holy angels that came to the rabbis and told them, hey, there's gonna you know the adversary and his princes sometimes they possess people. And if they possess people, this is how you're supposed to carry out an exorcism. You uh, pray to God or ask the demon its name. Well, you ask the demon its name first. So if that was the way it was, then that would be an infallible authoritative tradition that is not derived explicitly or implicitly from the Old Testament. So that would negate soul scriptura, correct? Well, they uh, Protestants, well, I guess everybody that believes in that would say it doesn't really matter how it happened to come up. But if uh, any part of the scripture endorses that procedure, good enough for me. Uh, and we like uh, like Thomas Aquinas said, not everything in the Bible is even supposed to be direct revelation, such as when it refers you to historical sources. Like it says, if you want to know more about this guy, check out the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel and Judah. There's several references like that in the historical books. Well, Aquinas said, you don't think that uh, those books were divinely inspired, the book of Yashur. Uh, I mean, it might have been, but there's no need for that. He says, you see what Revelation and inspiration are not the same thing. Uh, inspiration is the guidance of, of the Holy Spirit, uh, maybe more than guidance, the direction of the Holy Spirit to use this source and not that one, to, to edit it, perhaps. Uh, it's not like you have to see it and you, who is this guy, King David? And what about Goliath? It's not like you saw it in a vision. These were traditions. And Aquinas said, don't, uh, you, you make a needless trouble for yourself. Uh, revelation is something like in the, the book of Revelation, where then I saw this portent in the, the heavens. That's revelation. Uh, oh, whether fair. true or false, the, the genre, that's revelation. Uh, if uh, Isaiah says, thus saith Yahweh, I will do so and so, well, that would be revelation. Uh, but if, uh, but as, as like modern scholars say, going to the book of Revelation again, this probably never was actually experienced as a revelation. It looks like a kind of patchwork of, of slightly rewritten passages from, especially from Daniel, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. And uh, you see, this one's here, and this comes from that, and it's all sort of sewn together. Well, Aquinas would say, hey, fine. Uh, it was uh, the inspiration comes in with God guiding them to pick this and that and weave it together in a certain way. So uh, in a way, that's kind of a false problem. But the, the exorcism thing, the only precedent I know of offhand in the Bible is when it says that King Saul uh, was, was afflicted with an evil spirit and suddenly develops this desire to murder King David. And... Um, and tries to about four times. And David seems to realize this is not really Saul. There's something else going on here. But he manages to soothe him with, by playing the liar. And so apparently that was a, a kind of an exorcism. But the when Jesus refers to, th this gets uh, more complicated than you probably can stay awake through. But uh, the when, like, who was Beelzebul? They say, ah, oh, this guy's just casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. Who? Uh, well, 
uh, Beelzebul was uh, a fusion of at least two ancient non-Jewish deities. Uh, there was, uh, 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 let's see, uh, uh, let's see here. One was uh, uh, an uh, the law, like somebody's version of the ultimate God, because Beelzebul means the Lord of the house, meaning the Lord of the inhabited world. Uh, another one was the a Lord of ghosts, and another was, um, uh, let's see, an exorcism patron. You'd use his name to cast out demons. Well, Jesus assumes that you know who Beelzebul was and that he was a sort of a chancy character. Uh, and uh, here's the, the thing. I think traditional interpretations of that whole story are grossly mistaken. If you read the whole thing, Jesus says, uh, how can a burglar uh, despoil a householder of his goods unless he binds him, ties him up first, and then he can uh, plunder his household? And uh, so what's his point? That uh, I am despoiling Beelzebub, or whichever name you want to give him, uh, of his possessions, the possessed people, uh, because I have bound him to my service, and I am forcing him to cough up his hostages. Uh, and uh, he didn't want to do it, but I, drawing on the power of God or whatever, uh, am able to do that. Well, that's, and when he says, by whom do your sons cast him out? That's how they all did it, uh, on up into the Middle Ages. If you look at these magic books, they they invoke an angel to get a demon to do something. Well, Solomon, he managed to press the Asmodeus and the other demons into service to carry the huge blocks of stone uh, from the quarry. You know, how'd they build the pyramids? Well, how'd he build the temple? Uh, by having these demons carry the, the, the stones. Uh, so was Solomon a Satanist? No! Uh, he could bind the power of Satan. And that's the point, I think, with Jesus. He's defending and he's saying, what if I am? Uh, and, and indeed, who doesn't do this? This is what exorcism is, you guys. And uh, But uh, the, the gospel writers sort of don't like that, which is why they have added that preface, how can Satan cast out Satan? Satan and Beelzebul were not the same character, though the later oh, wow. gospel writers don't seem to know that. And uh, about the thing with the demoniac uh, of G G Garaza, uh, you notice it, it, uh, the demoniac says to Jesus, I adjure you, uh, don't cast us out. Well, that word, adjuration, we know that the standard exorcism formula required the exorcist to ask for the name because they thought that gave you power. They wouldn't want to tell you their name because if you knew it, you could command them. And he he can't stop it. Jesus gets him to say it. But then the exorcist would say, I adjure you, the demon, to get the hell out of this guy. Uh, so, well, wait a minute. Is the demoniac saying it to Jesus? Well, the, the Christian narrator doesn't really like the idea that Jesus has to use a, a ritual to, to get rid of the demon. I mean, he's the son of God. He can just kick him right out, couldn't he? And so the, they have to change the story to, to theologically sand it down. And that's why Matthew and Luke chop these weird little anecdotes where Jesus heals people using faith healing techniques of contemporary magicians, uh, <laughs> smearing mud on the eyes and have them wash it off as if he is washing off the blindness. It's, it's called imitative magic. Uh, or he puts his fingers in the ears of the deaf man, pulls them out and says, F -ba -ba, be opened, as if deafness is blocking the ears and and so forth uh, it, these are well-known tactics that the ancient magicians use but matthew and luke say oh uh, i uh, jesus wouldn't have needed to do that he could just say okay be healed uh and uh, so there's this nervousness about this uh and uh we got to just make him you know the all-powerful son of god and I, that's why i think they 
utterly missed the point of the Beelzebul controversy. Oh, interesting. Okay. All righty. Thanks for that elucidation. All right. So um, it's like every question that, uh, like is like leading up to the other question I'm going to ask. This is cool. All right. <laughs> so the same thing with this one. This is going into an interesting point. I really haven't heard anyone talk about. Even Carrier um, hasn't talked about this that much. And I think it's an interesting point to make. Um, you know, if Jesus did all these miracles and, you know, like, like, for example, we take the New Testament as all literally true and the Pharisees understand that his miracles have no chance of a natural explanation. And after Jesus debunks the Beazabur or Satan theory, you know, you have what's interesting is that the Jews, it doesn't say they did this explicitly, but it implies that they accepted Jesus's debunking and his logic to debunk the Beazabur theory. So now they're now convinced that Jesus is exercising demons by the finger of God, which is just another way of saying by God, and God's given them good magic to exercise the demons. So now they're like, okay, so we realize that the medium of Jesus' power is God. But then they're still not convinced he's the Messiah. They still ask him, hey, teacher, you know, we know you're doing these miracles by God. Okay, you've convinced us they're not from the devil but uh we wish to seek a sign from thee and like you just question you're like well didn't he just do a sign that's what he literally did was a sign from heaven and so but but jesus it's like you know how jesus likes to assume things even if they're not true or act like they're true just for the sake of a rhetorical point or making an argument he buys the the jews logic that what he has done is not a good enough sign, even though in and of itself he is. So he accepts that he could give a greater sign and says, well, I'm not going to give you a greater sign. Uh, that's going to happen, you know, when, you know, the fulfilling of Jonas uh, out of the, or Jonah out of the whale happens, which is an allusion to the resurrection. Like Jonah, Jonah got out of the whale, I'm going to get out of the tomb. But like, here's the, here's, and like Craig talks about this too with Ben Shapiro. It was like, you know, if Jesus did a miracle by God, it's one thing. But if God raises him from the dead, if you examine the socio-religioso context, this is, when God raises Jesus from the dead, this is more validating because he's raising him and therefore implicitly validating his ministry. But like, when you think about it, that's exactly what God's doing when he does miracles and Jesus to exercise demons. Like, it all goes back to, like, um, well, went back to Abraham, but it's more clear in Moses, in the story of Moses, where Moses is, like, uh, he's talking with the burning bush, and he, after he's done talking with the burning bush, claiming to be God, or whether it's just an angel being, it's God's legal representative, we don't even know. So, uh, anyway, so then Moses is like, hey, God, so, uh, oh, the Israelites going to believe that I was talking with a burning bush that was God. They're going to think I'm a stupid idiot. Like, what am I going to do about that? And God's like, okay, so I'll give you three magical signs and take out, you know, your hand from your pocket and you'll have leprosy on it. And he says, I'm going to get a wooden, you can take a wooden staff, put it on the ground, turn to an alligator and it says, I actually chased Moses. Then I'll take an urn or I'll give you an urn, put it in the water or put water in it. And then, you know, the water will turn into blood. Okay, so like, here's the thing. And it's like, so, the, so these miracles, these signs are done as a divine stamp approval of the guy's ministry. So it's like the, the point about like the Pharisees and, and not being convinced that Jesus is the Messiah after these miracles. It, like what they did was just as stupid as like Elijah raising the widow's son. And they know this comes from the power of God. And they still doubt whether, uh, whether Elijah is a true prophet or not. It just doesn't make any sense. It's like, I think what Christians will say is, well, just because, you know, Jesus, he he, viol he allegedly violated the Torah so much, uh, you know, and stuff like that. And But it's like, I'm sure, like, you know, even assuming this Bible stuff is true, there were unrecorded times where, you know, Jews had contention with Moses and Elijah about interpreting the 650 laws. Because, hey, you know, just because someone's a prophet doesn't mean they always get everything right. Like, hey, look at Peter and Acts and him being discriminatory against the Gentiles because they weren't getting their penises cut. And Paul calls them out and says, no, you're preaching a false gospel, Peter. It's not like the, the prophets and apostles always understood the message of Christ infallibly. So it's like, I'm sure there was contentions with like Moses and Elijah about, hey, you're saying this law number 372 means this, Moses, but really it means this. And like, there had been debates and Moses had been like, well, God hasn't revealed to me exactly, you know, probably never will exactly what the interpretation of this law is. So yeah, you know, it's debatable from the point of 
it's debatable whether I'm interpreting it right or not. But, you know, just trust that God's doing miracles in me. And, like, you know, why would he be doing miracles in me unless I was right? So just take that as proof that my interpretation is right, even though I can't prove it to you, you know, using, like, you know, like natural methods or whatever. So it's like, it, like so it's like the same thing with Jesus. It's like, okay, he seemingly is violating the Torah a lot. You know, he's saying things like Sabbath was for man, not man for Sabbath or whatever like that. And even though we disagree with him, hey, he's doing these miracles. So it's like, why did they just want him to be crucified and hand him over to Pilate? Like, I, I like I can't I can't ima I can't imagine you know the trial of Jesus being like, oh, okay, we know he does miracles by God. We know in a three year ministry he's done more than half the miracles <laughs> in our Bible. Yet we're still not convinced he's the Messiah, even though we've seen these signs from heaven. We require an additional sign from heaven, whatever that was. It definitely wasn't the resurrection they. Said. But they they couldn't comprehend how an individual could resurrect before the general resurrection having the more glorified body. So it's like whatever the sign from heaven was, and then it's like you know, and then the deal is, uh, you know, when Jesus's anthropomorphic dad appeared in front of Peter, James, and John the Mount of Transfiguration and said, "Well, see, that was a sign from heaven, but it was just for Peter, James, and John because I'm sure they had doubts about Jesus' messiahship." And then God Himself settled it down. So like I'm wondering why He didn't just appear in front of the Sanhedrin. Before the crucifixion of Jesus instead of the debate. Of course, we all know what the real Jesus would have said if I were to have asked him that. But if I knew about the man of transfiguration, of then you would be like, well, Edward, you know, if I gave the true sign from heaven to everybody, then they know I'm the Messiah and I couldn't be crucified. And if I'm not crucified, I can't die for people's sins. But so, yeah, like a little bit of a predicament, you know. But so it's like, so her, to get to the point before I ask uh, to formulate my question more clearly, it's like, I'm thinking if these real miracles happened back then, there's just no reason to doubt Jesus is the Messiah because it's like him rising from the dead is no more a convincing sign than God giving him the ability to cast out demons. They're both divine stamps of approval. So, like, yeah, what, like, what do you think of this? <laughs> well, uh, there are a couple of things uh, with the sign of Joan. Well, the thing about the um, Lord, whatever, Master, we would see a sign from you. And uh, Jesus says, in effect, y you're you're oblivious to what's happening here. He says, you can interpret the, the signs in the heavens above us, the weather. Uh, you know whether it's going to rain or not. If you see the, the an aura around the moon and all that, and you'll be right. Yeah. But why don't you see what is happening around you? And then he quotes Isaiah and says, uh, the blind receive their sight, uh, the lame walk, the poor have the gospel preached to them and so forth. Uh, and and uh, he says, blessed is the one who does not stumble on account of me. That you, you take offense and say, ah, oh, this guy can't be uh, the real thing. He says this to John the Baptist's disciples. Well, I think it's like he's he's saying, uh, look, if I did some kind of big miracle, that wouldn't satisfy you. You're determined not to believe. You'll explain whatever I do. If I flew into the sky, you'd, you'd say there was some kind of a phony trick here. Uh, it's like confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. They're really challenging Jesus to embarrass him. And uh, I like the way it is in The Last Temptation of Christ when Pilate is talking to Jesus and uh, he says, I'd, I'd like to see you do some miracle. Uh, really, Herod says that in, the, in Luke. But Jesus says, uh, I I'm not a circus animal. You know, I'm, I'm not like a dancing bear uh, to do some stunt for your amusement. Uh, that's, I think, the point where he says, you know who needs signs to believe? A sinful and adulterous generation. That's who. And I'm not going to condescend to do that. You can't manipulate me into this. If you had any real faith, you, that wouldn't even occur to you. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, and in fact, it may well be that that passage comes from a time when Jesus was not believed to have done any miracles. When he says, I'll tell you what, no sign is going to be given to this generation. So nobody's going to see me doing, well, the Gospels are filled with these signs. Uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, the, there's a history of this passage because it occurs in three different forms in the Gospels. The next time we hear it is no sign will be given except, of course, the sign of Jonah. 
for this, uh, the, as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. Uh, what does that mean? I mean, Jonah didn't do any miracle. It, it, you mean he preached and got repentance from the last people who you think would repent? The Assyrians? Is that what he means? Well, he doesn't clarify it, but he doesn't, but whoever added that was obviously uncomfortable with the idea of Jesus saying, I'm not going to give you a sign, a miracle. And then Matthew gets a hold of it and adds the Jonah uh, whale uh, part, where, he's, he, where he makes it very explicit. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Why did this not make it into any other gospel. Well, Matthew wants to have Jesus predict his resurrection in the ears of his enemies so that they can go tell Pilate, you know, uh, we think there may be a hoax in the works here, because uh, that deceiver said he would rise, and that probably means his disciples are going to steal the body. You think you can forestall that? So it's very complex the way they've, they've done it and redone it. But the real punchline, I think, is in Luke in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, where this poor jerk uh, finds himself in Hades, uh, frying away, and he says to Father Abraham, uh, my uh, my brothers are uh, worse than me. Do you think you could send Lazarus here, who is <laughs> up in heaven? Uh, could you send him to my brothers to tell them to straighten out before it's too late? And Abraham says to him, "You're kidding yourself. Uh, if they they've got well, he says they've got the Moses and the prophets. They already know what they should be doing." He said, "Yeah, yeah, I know, but they they won't listen to the scriptures. But they'd never be able to evade the implications of, of somebody rising from the dead." He says, "Don't kid yourself. If they're not listening to Moses and the prophets, nothing would convince them. Even if a guy came back from the dead to to tell them to repent, now, that is really rational thinking. You'd find some like." Uh, what does Marley say to Scrooge? Why would you doubt the evidence of your own senses? He says, oh, because a little uh, thing distorts them. And uh, he's getting into John Locke and all this stuff. Uh, yeah, if you're determined not to believe this, you will find some way to debunk it. And, and that's true of scientific theories. I, I'm sorry, I just can't believe in the Big Bang Theory. I think this must be what happened. Well, uh, that seems far-fetched to me, but if you're determined, or creationists, uh, they just cannot stomach evolution, so they'll come up with any ridiculous rationalization. Uh, and so it's the same thing. It's confirmation bias. Oh, and one last thing. Uh, Jesus is never actually shown flouting the Torah. Uh, what uh, It's always... a uh, a debate between him and his fellow scholars as to what the Torah actually demands. Hey, you're healing on the Sabbath. Hey, that's not a problem unless you're a physician who charges for healing. Yeah. That's not what he's doing. It actually comes up in the Mishnah. It says if you heal by a word, an incantation, that's okay. Or the Sabbath, uh, the thing where you quoted, uh, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You've got several of the rabbis saying, the Sabbath is delivered unto you. You are not delivered unto the Sabbath. It's the same thing. Or Jesus says, you people, you're hypocrites. So you you say, uh, honor your father and mother, but then you tell your aged parents, mom, dad, I'm sorry, the money I was going to support you with, I'm going to give it to the temple instead. Uh, what? Uh, and uh, it, that comes up several times in the Mishnah, and the rabbis all say what Jesus did. You can't do that. Uh, and so uh, it looks kind of like Jesus is just saying, oh, yeah, we got to keep the Sabbath. We we can't work. Now, what does that mean? And does it apply across the board? I mean, you circumcise the kid on the eighth day, even if it's the Sabbath. Uh, well, if I heal the man's whole body, you know, why, why is that wrong? He's not saying, oh, to hell with the Sabbath. I'll do what I want. And uh, this is all a kind of Lutheran Protestant anti-Judaism to make Jesus look like he's Martin Luther. But that's not the way the Gospels is describing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gotcha. So, yeah. So it's like, I wonder what 
like convince the Jews that, you know, if he rose from the dead and there's an empty tomb, like how is that more convincing than like him raising someone from the dead, Christ himself? I think it's like the way it is, is like truly speaking, like the exorcism of by God is no less mm -hmm. convincing than God raising him from the dead. But from the Jews subjective standpoint, they reckon God raising Jesus from the dead as like more confirming of his, of his ministry than God doing miracles in him. You know, you know what I'm saying? But like well, yeah, really at the same level. What do the, the uh, uh, Sanhedrin members say to Pilate? If they're able to pull this off, the final deception will be the worst of all. So uh, the the rather the insidious influence of Jesus, as they imagine it, is only going to get worse after his death if you don't outwit these guys. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that the Pharisees apparently have no role in the uh, the uh, accusation and execution of Jesus. The, the most of the Sanhedrin were Sadducees; almost all the high priests were. And uh, they, and what does Paul say that uh, he's gotten in trouble simply because? he uses Jesus as exhibit A of the doctrine of the Pharisees that people will rise from the dead. Uh, and so mm. that that's a big clue that that's what they didn't like about this, that, uh, that uh, oh, Jesus is too much of a Pharisee. Now, whether he actually was or not is, is a difficult historical question, but how is it presented in the story? And, and it's I think that gets distorted quite a bit. Yeah, and it's like it's interesting because assuming the historicity of the guard story is true, I know we've uh, debated about problems of this of this historicity. People, uh, you should check out um, one of my earlier interviews. You talk about the problems of the guard story. But even assuming it happened, I wonder how many of the Sanhedrinists during the time frame of Acts when the apostles were interrogated. I wonder how many of them actually knew what really happened uh, insofar as the situation of the guards because the the. So the cover story was, you know, that they fell asleep at night, and then the apostles stole the body. So they know it was the apostles, you know. Could, yeah. could, could or that been, anybody hey, stole could, it. Could have been necromancers practicing, you yeah, know, yeah. on Jesus off-site. Hey, could that, happen. That's hey, true, Carter, actually. That could be, if, if it was stolen, that's one big reason it would have been. Hey, this guy did miracles. We could sell fingers off the body to magicians. I mean, that was not uncommon. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it's like, but here's the thing, like if, you know, people knew of the truth that, you know, actually the real story is that, you know, the guards, Roman or Jewish saw an angel and then, you know, they fainted and they woke up and saw Jesus' body missing. That would indicate that, you know, Jesus rose from the dead. But it's like, it looks like most of the Sanhedrinists did not know what really happened. They just thought that the cover story was real, that the apostles stole the body of Jesus by night as the guards slept. Because think about it, if all the Sanhedrinists knew what really happened with the guards, that they indeed saw the angel in an empty tomb, they would be like, oh, Jesus is the Messiah. He he, he has resurrected. And they would have been like, okay, we won't uh, condemn you for preaching the name of Jesus. Right, like this was, I guess this was like classified above top secret. This uh, conversation with the chief priests and scribes about, you know, uh, not many people knew about, you know, them telling, hey, telling the guards, hey, you know, you uh, here's some, you know, a large sum of money, go tell a lie, and and if Pilate finds out about this, we'll somehow get you out of it, even though you'll be guilty of dereliction of guard duty. Duties yeah, yeah, exactly your life's that. true. It's like it's a crazy. Doesn't make yeah. sense historically. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, well, but like. <laughs> It's just it's just an interesting deal because um like going on the angel it's like um you know why does Matthew have it sitting on a rock you know presumably for a period of time why not just go directly in the tomb because presumably it was on the rock and then went in before the women got there well it was on the rock because there would be like you know the Jewish enemies of Christianity in the morning, maybe going across, you know, the grave or going across, you know, Joseph of Arimathea's honorable, um, you know, tomb and see, seeing the, you know, the white angel with, you know, lightning closed. They're, oh, hey, what the heck's that? And go up to the, go up to it. And then, be, hey, I am an angel sent by Yahweh. I'm here to confirm twice third paper. Do you know that Messiah you're calling a blasphemer and saying he's doing demonic miracles? This guy, you know, he's the real deal. He rose from the dead. And that's why I'm here to confirm that the, 
tomb is empty. <laughs> I'm just a Margian embellishment to show you that the tomb's empty, not because the apostles stole the body, not because the gardener took him out, not because uh, Joseph of Arimathea wanted to bury him in the criminal's graveyard, and he didn't want to break the Sabbath law, so he put him in the honorable burial as a temporary holding place, and put him in the criminal's graveyard. And that, none of that stuff, it's because he rose from the dead. So it's like, you know, so it's like, here's the thing, it's so like the angel's like validating why the tomb is empty. It's only because Christ rose from the it's dead. So here's the thing. It's like, how come that angel didn't just get off its hiney and just, you know, it's faster than the speed of light. Just go to every Jew in the area and be like, hey, Jesus rose from the dead. Because that's what the re reason was. You know, that the Jews are walking by, just go like, hey, you know, Jesus rose from the dead. Or just say, yell it. Hey, Jesus rose from the dead. So just go around, go to the Sanhedrin during Ash, just tell everyone Jesus rose from the dead and check out the tomb. I just don't understand why it's just sitting on the rock and... Oh, well. <laughs> well, that, I guess they could only rewrite the story to a certain extent. Yeah, like and, uh, about, yeah, yeah. because people say, what? Where did you get this? in fact that's i think why mark ends where it does uh, with this odd thing that the women disobey the guy and don't tell anybody well uh the reason for that obviously it seems to me is that mark created that uh and uh because he's trying because uh he knows this nobody's ever heard this part of the story before because he created it, and so he's trying to explain, uh, if he just sends this out without that, they're going to be veteran Christians who say, look, son, I've been a Christian for decades now. How come I never heard of this? Oh, uh, it's because the uh, the women sat on it and kept mum about it until now. <laughs> what? Uh, and uh, that's often, it's like uh, the transfiguration. After it's over, he says to the disciples, now don't tell anybody about this until the son of man rises from the dead uh, why uh well apparently uh nobody ever heard of this before because it was a resurrection appearance itself but they, they've uh, moved it back into the story earlier uh and uh and now but but people have only they have heard of it as a resurrection story, Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, Mark doesn't like that for some reason. So he says, well, yeah, you only heard about it after the resurrection, uh, but it, that doesn't mean it happened then. And uh, there's a yeah. whole different point to the transfiguration. The thing with don't worry about Moses and Elijah, Jesus is where it's at now. And uh, apparently that was the big statement they wanted made. Yeah, you know, and like I have a theory that like uh, like the reason there's like this doubting, even when Christ does all these miracles allegedly from God, there's all there's still this doubting. They're still referring to him informally as this, you know, this man, you know, during the uh, emergency meeting of the Sanhedrin after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. I think what really happened is the historical Jesus did like things perceived to be miracles, but they're kind of like John Piper things, like things you have to have faith in. Not exactly clear that there's a supernatural explanation. This is what the historical Jesus did all into his life until the day he died. And then later on, myth and embellishment, embellishing the stories to make the Christ uh, figure more palatable to a Jew and Gentile audience, people started inserting, not necessarily, I mean, they could have been lying, but sometimes the legends can happen without malicious intent. It's just like kind of mm -hmm. like a bad game of telephone thing. So, you know, miracles were added into the real Moses, Elijah level miracles were added to his ministry to make it more believable that he was indeed the Messiah to compensate for all the lack of the clear miracles he did during his earthly ministry. So it's like you have kind of like a, a web of truth ingrained into these narratives. Like the whole, this is now, that now it makes sense why there's this doubting now. If he's just doing things like, you know, John Piper, you have to have faith and they're not exactly miracle. They're not, ex it's not exactly clear they're miracles. They could have an actual explanation. This is why they would doubt him and give him to the, to the pilot and say, hey, this guy's a false messiah. It wouldn't make any sense to give him if he's doing the real miracles like Moses and Elijah and stuff like that. So the, the, the truth, in a sense, is in this that there was really doubting. But it wasn't because there was doubting because they were just super skeptical. They were like, oh, we need more than a miracle of God. We need a special one, like a sign from over. It's because like he, he just did things that weren't that impressive. But like but, but like the, the false narrative is, you know, the addition of miracles. So you have like a... a, a 
a welding or a merging of like myth and history in these narratives. That's what I think. Well, that's not at all improbable. Yeah, that's very likely. Though we also hear that in the ancient world, uh, there were loads of charlatans around who uh, are like today's stage magicians. Only today, the magician is saying, I don't have magic powers, but I can perform these illusions and you will never figure out how I did it. And that's the marveling we do. So how the heck did he do this? And we yeah. don't even want to know how because we want to have the uh, the thrill of this. But it, the ancients said, I've got magic powers, just watch. And uh, they they may have claimed to be gods and avatars and stuff. And so we, we don't lie about it anymore because you don't need to. It's just as good to be baffled. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but the, in the ancient times, they were trying to get away with something. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All they're right. So, Jesus with that. Yeah. yeah, gotcha. Sounds good. Alrighty, so going into our last question. So uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the A and Sure and Right uh, argument from Roman society and Roman law that you know was as popular as Godin and stuff back in the day. The whole where uh, Carrier analyzes, and I actually talked to him about it during our second interview uh, about uh, A and Sure and Right. Uh, uh, the quote to paraphrase: He analyzed the tempo of myth making. And show that, you know, with like Apollonius to, of Diana when the Hagiographies came out, the addition of him doing all these miracles that he clearly didn't do, like came 150 years later after Apollonius of Diana lived. And like, you know, I don't know if he analyzed Muhammad, but I'm sure he knew of Muhammad. Like the Hadith came like 130 years later and clearly gives him miracles he didn't do. And they're, as Frank Turek, the Christian apologist, points out, they're so similar to Christ, so they're probably just kind of like, Quite Christing Muhammad to make him more believable, and like the hadith oh, yeah, doesn't really make sense. Yeah. yeah, the hadith doesn't really make sense because remember what, what it said of Muhammad when he was asked to do miracles. Oh, if I just do miracles, people will think they come from devils. But now he's doing so. There's a little bit of problem there. So and then like with Alexander the Great, you know, miracles were attributed to him, but that you know that the the written accounts come 400 years later of course brunt and his colleague was like yeah the written accounts come 400 years later but the oral traditions you know they could have arisen during the time of alexander himself which is debatable if there were that's any oral traditions i mean yeah. i think with the gospels that's simply a, an apologetics device for even from liberal theologians they they realize they're uncomfortable with a gap between the ostensible time of jesus and the writing of these books uh well is there any way to bridge that well yeah suppose they were just orally transmitting it yeah that's the ticket uh and it uh there's no real reason to think that it looks to me more like like you mentioned before that they were just rewriting old testament adventures of moses elijah elisha and so forth on the assumption as david friedrich strauss pointed out in the 19th century that when the messiah comes oh he's going to outdo the other heroes of israel anything they could do he could do better and so they began copying and refashioning the story so now it's jesus who r raises up the kid uh, from the dead and uh, feeds the multitude with the uh, magically produced food uh, it seems to me that uh, there's just uh, that, that this is fictional and that there even jesus may be fictional there's simply no way to know anymore mm -hmm. gotcha all righty yeah so okay so uh, to continue my argument, so he's like, okay, so temple myth, like when myth making and legend happens, it takes so long after events usually. So Ansher and White was like, well, you know, by the time the gospels were written, you know, that's like one to two generations after Christ's death. So it's like that's not enough time for a oh, lot. It's of way life. more than enough time. Yeah, yeah. But there've been a lot that. of studies since then. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll get uh, to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll let you uh, answer on that. So, but yeah, his claim was like, yeah, it's just uh, too short of time for the hard historic core to be destroyed. Of course, he didn't say none of it could be destroyed, but just the hardcore store, hard store core could not be destroyed. And of course, you know, to kind of go on what you're saying, Carrie is like, oh, actually, sometimes it has like an area 51. Look what happened to there. The egg over mm -hmm. of St. Genevieve. We actually talked about that. And so that kind of goes against what Aaron Sherman White was saying. Of course, that doesn't prove that the hard historic core was ruined. It just means it could have been a short time. I think the same thing, you know, with like other events too and stuff like that. But like, here's the thing. 
I think Aaron Sheridan White's methodology is, is fallacious because he's just going off of patterns. He's saying most like most of the time, you know, miracles take miracle embellishments of miracles and the destroying of the heart of store core just takes so long. Therefore, every time it has to take so long. But it's like he's not understanding the writer's motive, perhaps, but the other people, it took so long to legendize, you know, the the you know a figure of importance because he wasn't like too important or there just wasn't mo much of a motive but with christ there was much of a motive to legendize and mytho mythologize him early on since he claimed to be the foreseen messiah that was prophesized in the old testament you know he's a bigger deal and you know he claimed to be the, the, I, I don't know what the historical Jesus really claimed. Uh, perhaps he claimed to be the savior, you know, of the world. This doesn't apply that he actually was, but he made claims like that. And if he's saying things like, I'm the way into heaven, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, well, people are going to have more of a motive to mythologize him to get people, more people to have faith and stuff like that. So that's why you have, or, you know, early at, you know, you could have part of store core being destroyed early on. But, you know, I think it's like a, I think it's like a Jewish thing where you have, um, uh, the the historic poor being ruined early on, like the same thing with Josephus' account of signs in the sky, where that he mentions during the Jewish War. You know where he mm. says, I mean, just ten years after the Jewish War, Josephus is writing and saying, hey, you know, a lamb was born to a calf. There was a light shining over the Temple of Jerusalem for thirty minutes, and it, it didn't have a it didn't have a natural origin. It came from God. There was angels in the sky that said, let us depart hence. Even some of the Jews believed in this stuff because Tacitus reports in his history that the Jews believed in this. So it's like, I think it's like, it might be that maybe like the Jews are like, okay, we, we really hate those Gentiles. We got to make us, our religion more palatable. Let's just destroy the hard historic core and, and make, you know, accounts of miracles so early after a certain time period so we can outbeat the pagans and our religion could be more convincing. Maybe it's that, you know, so. Yeah, there's all kinds of things. I, I have a little example from my own experience. A couple of years ago, I had just found out from my brother th uh, that uh, uh, that uh, one of my mother's brothers, who I knew had died in a car accident uh, way back, I guess, probably in the 20s or 30s uh and uh i but what i did not know was uh he had gotten in trouble with the ku klux klan they lived in mississippi uh and they, these clan bastards drove him off the road into a ditch where he died in an accident uh and the same time i learned that one of my father's brothers uh, my uncle william who i met uh and later in his life uh, that we knew he went upstairs he had people it's really weird he had friends over for dinner and uh excused himself and went upstairs and kaboom he shot himself why well it turns out that uh he had re he had fought the ku klux klan and gotten threats from them and he realized that they were going to go after his family uh, to get to him and he didn't well in order to protect them he said let me just finish myself off and they'll have no reason to go after my so I mentioned astonishingly I found out that two of my uncles were in effect killed by the Klan uh, and at least I was proud of them as kind of martyrs against these racist um, hooligans well, uh, I heard just recently that some of the leftists who were criticizing me uh, said that I had said I had uncles who were members of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, that didn't take very long, uh, but it was totally reversed because they were inclined to think that as a Trump fan, I must be the devil incarnate. And so, I mean, if that can happen with a, a pipsqueak like me, you can imagine Imagine anything can happen with with people's legends and so on. Yeah, gotcha. All righty, a good good answer to the question. All right, so last question, one, one more follow up. So, and mm. uh, this has to do with this is relating to Roman society and Roman law. So, um, I, and I wish Ain't Sure and White were alive because I like to ask him about like the the Roman ruling 
of a certain issue in Acts. It has to do with Paul and Silas and the slave girl who was you know, allegedly possessed by the demon called Python that gave her the ability, I guess, to have more virilic cries, different virilic cries than is naturally explainable. And then, you know, Paul says, hey, demon, shut up. And the girl, I'm going to cast you out. And so the slave owners get note of that. And they're like, oh, okay, because these people, exor or Paul exercised the demon out of our slave girl, or she's not able to be, you know, really crazy and stuff like that. So we're not making money for our false soothsaying business. So they bring uh, Paul and Silas to, like, I guess the, the then equivalent of, like, a... Uh, Maybe like a not a maybe a sheriff or not a sheriff. I guess the the count the county like police officer. I don't know the overseer, legal overseer. So they bring them to the legal overseer, and then the guy's like, oh, okay. So that he hears the story. <laughs> he just he imagine like Paul coming in saying, okay, so here's the deal, uh, the Roman officer. So I use my supernatural magic powers to cast out a demon of a slave girl, and because of this. The, the the slave owner of the slave girl wants to make like a press civil charges on me for disrupting the peace for exercising a demon out of someone mm -hmm. and then the the roman officers is like okay this goes against you know the law of the land so we're gonna have like paul and seal is beaten or something and then like in prison and then they let him go or whatever I, i'm like thinking mm -hmm. like i would like to ask aaron sure and white about this because i think like what really would have happened is not that the roman officer the gentile officer would have been like beat on me just would have been like um you're telling me that someone with uh, what, what could be supernatural pretend powers? Someone like a five. It's like this. Like reminds me when I was a five year old and my 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 sister was like, oh, I'm uh, Aphrodite and you're one of the slaves and I'm just gonna do miracles over you. You're my slave or whatever. I'm gonna control you. This is like what this sounds like. Gonna, like how do I do if any of this happened? And like even if it did, who cares? They exercised a demon out of someone. How is that a problem? He was just like, like yeah. shut up. I'm 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 done with my nine hour shift. I'm like done. Like it just doesn't really sound like something historical. It's like, oh well, I'm gonna take this seriously. Yeah. You know, get get put a punishment here. Like, but I can't imagine in the Roman law saying, hey, when an exorcist comes and does a miracle, this is how to handle it. Yeah. Because it was <laughs> done all over the place by Jews, Christians, pagans, whatever. They all uh, like Apollonius of Tyana. There's some real whoppers in that book about his uh, casting demons out and so forth. Uh, there were there were people that that staged these things, but there were also people that. Uh, apparently went through the same psychodrama as we would call it as exorcists do today because okay. a possessed person has the script in mind if they know about demons because of stories of demons being cast out so they know once they take on that role that it's only good for a while and eventually as soon as max von Sydow comes and starts slinging the holy water and saying the power of christ compels you then it's time to go the jig is up so, I mean, that was probably happening back then, too. But but apparently there were also just fakes that people, that, that the demoniac and the exorcist were in league together and that it was all a big show. Uh, and uh, so there was there were fake healings and, and all kinds of stuff uh, because everybody was so gullible. Of course, they are today, too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> they got Benny Hinn and... Oh. Oh. Yeah, all all that stuff. All righty. Well, this was a good interview. It was pretty fun. All righty. Well, yeah. uh, thanks again, Robert, for doing an interview with me. I think this is number seven. I might have done more interviews wow. with you than Doctor Dennis R. McDonald. Oh, he he's great though. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's fun. I love doing it. Yeah, mm. awesome. This was really nice. All righty. Well, you know the drill. After this is uh overall give you the link to this the youtube great, channel man. link and you can share it around do whatever you want with it all right thanks robert appreciate the time okay. and you and your wife have a good day you do